Ladies and gentlemen, the ancient God code of history has been found and translated. We've got Matthew LaCroix with us. Now, Matthew's been on the program several times before. He's, he's definitely a regular, one of my favorite people uh, to talk to. And you should definitely check out his new work. I'm actually holding it in my hands right now. You can go to the website, The Stage of Time, pick up a copy. And one thing that I noticed is if you go to page 201, ladies and gentlemen, not only is this book amazing, but if you go to page 201, it breaks down a list of different translations of ancient tablets, different um, prophecies and scriptures from the Nag Hammadi, the Emerald Tablets, the Atrahasis, the Creation Story Tablets. It's very detailed. And as Matthew brought up, this could be a book that has more ancient scriptures and translations in one in one back-to-back -back copy here. It's going to be really exciting today, folks. We're going to get into the God Code. We're going to talk about these ancient translations, this ancient information that has been suppressed and hidden for thousands of years. Where did the where did the makers of the Great Pyramids go? I mean, what happened to them? What happened to the giants and the beings that could manifest and create? Because it seems like they just disappeared. So, Matthew, it's an honor to have you on the program. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex, it's, as always, it's great to be back here. We, you and I always have fantastic discussions, and I'm really excited to get deep into it with you and talk all about uh, some of the work that I've done recently. And I just wanted to say that I, I not only appreciate our discussions here, but I appreciate everybody that supports my work. And this, this project, um, this stage of time, has been um, a long time project that's gone over the course of almost three years of work but um and we can get into that and, and discuss that and talk about some of these secrets of ancient history as we go as we get into it all right matthew let's roll man where do we start three years ago uh i wrote the illusion of us my previous book and while i was writing that and getting towards the end of it one of the big um ongoing things that kept popping up that i was noticing was that so many of the ancient translations I was reading, so much of the information that I was finding, I was never seeing it anywhere on, a, on an academic level. I wasn't seeing it, you know, with these huge articles online discussing it. I wasn't seeing it in newspapers. I wasn't seeing it in, in textbooks. I was only seeing it in these fringe areas of the internet and in some select authors that were brave enough to come out. But the thing about a lot of those authors is a lot of them, because the subject that we're going to get into tonight talks about such a vast area from the nature of reality all the way to the, you know, what defines the cosmos and what happened in ancient history thousands of years ago, because it covers such a wide area. Most author authors have decided to grab pieces of that because if you try to go too far and then maybe you're wrong or whatever, you can lose all your credibility because it's such a challenging area to try to figure out. And so one of the things that came up frequently that I noticed is that even in a lot of authors that talk about ancient history, they don't really talk about cuneiform tablets and they don't really talk about these ancient translations. And I, I started to think about why as I was writing them. And the why made me realize that, well, here we have an extremely difficult area that has been hidden within symbolism and hidden within metaphors. And it's difficult to decipher and determine exactly what these ancient cultures were saying. And so I realized quickly that, well, if someone doesn't do something to put all of these in one place, these ancient translations and these ancient texts from long ago, they could easily just disappear. And then people would almost never know they existed because they're not really being managed. You know, what happened to these ancient librarians of our past? Are they around anymore? Does anyone care if the secrets in wisdom that was imparted by ancient civilizations actually survives or it just disappears and then no one notices. I wanted to make sure that I'm not going to be one of those people that stands by and allows all of these secrets and evidence of ancient history to disappear and be confused within, mis within the realm of misinformation or fake news or whatever it wants to be called. So when, when you look at the evidence across the world, you start to put together and piece together what is very, very clear was that there has been at least one major lost civilization in Earth's history. And I mean, when I say lost civilization, that doesn't mean just specifically covering something like the idea of Atlantis, 
but it's it's the idea of a globally collect, connected civilization that once existed around the world that were likely based on um, seafarers and, and, tr and traveling around and, and building megalithic structures and you know using precise alignments with things like the equinoxes and the procession and, and the um and the solstice and, the, and all the various changes that occur over time and so these civilizations built all these grand structures but not only that they left behind very detailed um translations and descriptions of what occurred long ago in that during that time period and so when i the reason i wrote this book is that i i realized that all of these secrets from ancient history, these cuneiform tablets, these um, these clay baked tablets that are thousands and thousands of years old. Just imagine how far human civilization has come in the last couple hundred years, okay? And that would be just a little blip if you consider the fact that a lot of these cuneiform tablets, there's a lot of hard evidence that's showing that these that at least go back more than 10 to 12,000 years. And that means that some of those tablets may be that old. And I fully acknowledge the idea that some of these stories are so important that they would continue to carry them over and create other tablets as other civilizations go along. However, um, some of them may be in the original form. And that became something that was worth fighting for in my mind because those ancient secrets, whether, you, whether or not you want to talk about the emerald tablets and the wisdom that was imparted that came from Atlantis that went to Egypt and then gave rise to things like the, the book of Ra and things like that, all, all the way to the, the vast amount of information you find in places like Sanskrit and going through India and then down into Mesopotamia, specifically though, cuneiform tablets. Because like, think about what we have right now, it's the situation we have in front of us. There have been more than 30,000 cuneiform tablets that have been discovered in the area of Mesopotamia, Iraq, Syria area in the last 50 to 100 years. And of those, the majority of them are still untranslated, at least untranslated by those who can get their eyes on them and then publish the material. That means that the majority of the most ancient translations in human history, giving the secrets of everything that occurred in the past, is, is just being left on a dusty shelf somewhere and society is sort of moves past it and is, is too busy to really care. And, and these translations in these tablets, they contain the secrets of the past, okay? They, they truly contain this wisdom from these ancient civilizations that's been carried over. It contains the secrets of what occurred long ago, not only with where civilization came from, which may start a lot of people to learn, but where the laws, where agriculture, the, the knowledge of mathematics, um, astronomy, where all of that came from, everything was, is told to us in these tablets that it came down from above, and it was it was it was imparted to civilization. So what so what I wanted to do is not only does it explain where everything came from, but it explains these disasters that occurred that destroyed everything and how they had to keep rebuilding everything. So in in the latest book I call, I, I wrote the stage of time. Um, I wanted to just read quickly the translations that are included in it because really this goes far beyond in my mind, even, even me presenting evidence from across the world and, and putting together in, in a fashion where we can try to get an idea of what happened based on evidence and not just on conjecture and, and someone's biased opinion. But to me, what really is important about this are these ancient translations all in the same place. Like I was, I was talking to Rex earlier about this. We live in an age of disinformation and misinformation where you go online on the internet and maybe you come across one of these ancient translations and you say, wow, that's amazing. But then all of a sudden you're cruising the internet 15 minutes later and you come across somewhere where someone's completely trashing that tablet or whatever that information is. And they make you think that you're crazy and what you just read is a mistranslation and all of a sudden what you were just so sure about, you're not so sure anymore. And then you just give up the whole thing. And that happens for a lot of people because they just don't know where to look anymore because there's so much, so much, so much stuff to wade through. So what in this book, and I want to stress, it contains multiple translations sometimes of, for instance, of the, of the Atrahasis, which I consider the most important tablet of all time, this ancient flood story deluge. Yeah, go ahead, Rex. 
Yeah, let me jump in on that. Why do you feel that way? Well, the atrahasis is um, a lot of these tablets have been severely destroyed. Fragments, pieces of them and broken off. So some of these tablets where you start getting into some really important information about ancient history and the events that occurred, they'll just, they'll start talking about it, but then a whole section of the, of the tablet has been broken and lost. So you can't, you, you, you know, you think, you know what it wants to say, but you, you just don't have it anymore to get that. So the point is we have so many of these ancient texts in these translations, they they're, they're gone or they've been destroyed over time and they've been lost. So the Atrahasis is this rare t- tablet where, in the, in, because multiple versions of it have been created by different cultures um, and it's been protected pretty well, you not only have a very, very detailed story of the deluge from Atrahasis, who is known as Zaya Sudra or Noah in, in the biblical version, but you have a very, very, very detailed, the most detailed of any tablet I've seen of the origin story for humans and, and how we came about here and why we're here. And so, so, so because of that, things like the Adrahasis, I have three different tablets in here that, because they cover different areas of, of the human epic. So I just want to mention what is included in here. In, in, of course, that doesn't include the multiple translations, but the Adrahasis, the Book of Enoch, the Code of Hammurabi, the Numa Elish, the Legend of Atanya, Sumerian King List, Eridu Genesis, the Emerald Tablets, Nag Hammadi scriptures, Poimandres, the vision of Hermes, King James Bible, book of Genesis, Old Testament. So I wanted to preserve the secrets of ancient history because they tell a far different story than we're being told in school. This version that you're given once you go through high school and into college, you get this very, very specific version that hasn't changed really at all. And it's just, it simply states, let's lay this out there before we get into this so we can all be on the same page. Well, we're told in school and what everyone, most people believe because they've been taught that and, and their, their parental figures and authoritative figures then told them that. So it's been just carries on generation after generation is basically that the entire human story can, as in being, outside of um, hunter-gatherers, really sophisticated civilizations emerging with um, language and trading. That is is only, according to them, this mainstream doctrine is only around 6,000 years old. That's when it first began in the Fertile Crescent of Mesopotamia and then spread to other parts of the world. And then here we are, right? Everything that we see somehow fits into that model, that tiny little window of 6,000 years. And before that, human civilizations were slowly evolving from hunter-gatherers, and then they came from Neanderthals and Denisovians. And some of that's true. But what what you don't find in the history books are these enormous leaps that occur to human civilization and these gaps, these very significant gaps that occur. The Maya and the Aztec specifically state in their codexes and their writings that human civilization has been separated by at least three different epics where by terrible disasters okay so we're in the third epic right now okay that means that there have been two before us and when i think about those two go ahead rex yeah, I wanted to ask you a question because I've been doing a lot of research recently into the magnetosphere, the weakening magnetosphere, yeah. and it seems as if, based upon the information that I've got, we're in this grand solar minimum, this you know possibly the beginning of the solar cycle 25, and if you go back to 40, 42,000 years ago approximately, they discovered this tree in New Zealand. It's I was going to talk about that, actually. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you? Oh, matrix keys, matrix keys. <laughs> it's, so it. there's a reason I'm bringing this up. So it's talking about a, a near magnetic reversal 42,000 years ago. Now we are going through some major changes. The earth is changing. The magnetosphere is weakening. And it seems as if the poles are certainly shifting. There's plenty of evidence for that. You can go back to 2010 when they were having to update the runways at airports because of the, um, the poles. So my question is, do you think that the cycle we're in now is connected to the cycle that was about 40,000 years ago, which could have been quite catastrophic? 
Yeah, I think that may have represented the third cycle past. Okay, so I think of that cycle that that you're discussing. So Rex is talking about this this tree that was found in New Zealand, this ancient tree, and the tree was buried under rock, dirt, and mud, and was preserved for thousands and thousands of years. It's like basically a preserved record of the past, and they were able to take that tree and then analyze the tree rings, and they were they determined these climatic events and these things that occurred to the earth um, over a little over 40, 40,000 years ago, where there was a pole shift. But wait a minute, scientists and academics came out and were trying to tell us during some of the discussions of the last 10 years, when people were saying, well, there was a pole shift and that's what happened. Scientists and academics were coming out to say, well, geologic evidence and climate data doesn't support a pole shift for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago, blah, blah, blah. So it didn't, hasn't happened anywhere close to how it could have impacted the earth in the time frame that we're given. Well, here we go. This New Zealand tree is proving the contrary. And what Rex was saying is basically um, about 10 years ago, um, the, the native people across the world that hunt using the stars still, they noticed that the position, especially the Inuit of Northern Canada, they noticed that the position of the stars had shifted and they started to talk about it and discuss it with people. And a lot of mainstream was just considered them sort of silly and, you know, what do they know? And then because so much data came out, like you were saying, the poles and the shift, the shift of the pole is occurring so fast up in the North pole that they're having to send recon planes up there to try to reestablish where the new location is because it's screwing up GPS data all over around the world because of how closely we become dependent on that. So what does that mean? Well, we're jumping a little ahead here. So I want to, I want to go back, but I will return to this. What happened to all these civilizations? And is it, is it going to happen again now? That's the question. And I'm going to get into what happened to them. And then I'm going to talk about what's happening now. Cause I want to go, I want to go in order a little bit, but what we, and that's, that'll, that'll be a nice spot to go over here. When you I'm look at up the order sometimes, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. When you look at this, these ancient civilizations, you find that they've been separated by these very defined moments in history, these very defined moments. And you, and you go out in places like the Sahara desert and you find this desert glass, this shocked quartz and this glass that's been created that's scattered around the desert. And some people have come up with hypothesis that I was part of an ancient war or something. Okay. And others have said, okay, well, that's possible. But if you start putting the pieces together of what could, have, what could have created that glass with what you're talking about right now, it all starts to make sense. When you go to Karnak, Egypt, and when you go to Giza, the areas of along the Nile River with, with these, the pyramids that have been built and a lot of the temples, you find very distinctive building, several di different very distinctive building practices. One is very specific ancient megalithic technology with precision building using stones that were quarried in locations like the Aswan Quarry, which are hundreds and hundreds of miles away, okay? That was part of the ancient civilizations that, was that were first in Egypt, okay? Then you later see this dynastic pharaoh influence where they wrote all the hieroglyphs everywhere and they, they're, they were known as the dynastic pharaohs. I have to stress that those two areas, those two different time periods are thousands of years apart. And the dynastic pharaohs had nothing to do with any of those major um, precise structures that have been built in Egypt. In fact, in, in places like Karnak, in places up in Giza, you find some, some stones that have been built out of a material called travertine. It's a very hard material. Travertine isn't found anywhere outside of Turkey. That's over 1,000 miles away. And some of these travertine blocks that have been built up in the Great Pyramid of Giza and near um, above Osiris's shaft at a height of over 300 feet up. These over 100 megalithic stone size stone blocks that have been precisely aligned, uh, designed and then put into place. Some of them are built out of materials like travertine and granite that's from hundreds if not over a thousand miles away just to acquire these materials. Okay, so what does that matter? These ancient civilizations were trying to specifically use a certain type of quartz rich hard rock because they were building these massive temples and these megalithic structures because they were harnessing energy around the world and 
they were creating these massive vibrational harmonic frequency temples for raising human consciousness. And Rex brought this really great point up at the beginning where all these influences from the past that were here, they disappeared and they all left. That's one of the things that I think that these temples were all about. It was this connection to those other dimensions and those outside influences that we lost once all those structures were destroyed. So what you find essentially are these different time periods of building with different civilizations that are separated by massive cataclysms. So what destroyed them? That's really what, the, what gets down to the question. There's no, to me, in my mind, it's clear that those, those civilizations are all separated and defined. And you can see that by the building practices around the world. Um, but what, des what destroyed them was a little bit more of a tricky task. Now, there have been some really great researchers that I highly recommend. And I, but I think the ones that have nailed it on the head, it's probably a combination of Robert Schock, Anthony West, and probably Brian Forrester. And what they've come up with, the idea behind it is these cycles that seem to continue to occur on the earth over be between 10 and 20,000 years, they seem to keep happening over and over again. And what those cycles seem to happen is the sun seems to go through these cyclical cycles where it changes. Meanwhile, at the same time, there may be other disturbances in our outer solar system that may be playing a part in that as well. So it may be a combination of several factors that are coming in. But what, is, what's, what seems to be clear that's happening is every certain amount of time, civilization will rise up to a certain point. Then you'll have these changes that I just mentioned that will occur, and you'll have this gradual weakening of the electromagnetic sphere of the Earth. That Every time, it seems like it's the same exact thing. Then once that happens, once that, that magnetic sphere on the Earth that protects us from the solar winds, once that weakens, all of a sudden, if you get solar outbursts, coronal mass ejections and large solar outbursts that can aim at the Earth, you can have destruction so catastrophic that it's, it's like something out of an apocalyptic movie. And furthermore, that those events could coincide with things like the melting of an of a, of a, of a, uh, entire ice age, um, you know, raising sea levels up 400 feet and flooding everything along the coastal areas and all those cities that were part of these ancient civilizations were all buried under, under sea, uh, uh, flood under with seawater, like off Alexandria, Egypt, and all these places off of Southeast Asia and Japan. We see that all around the world. And and so what we've come up with is what, what a lot of these researchers and the evidence is really pointing at is that you see these, this combination of, of multiple disasters that all seem to trigger at the same time from a pole shift, which is caused by a certain amount of weakening of the electromagnetic sphere of the earth that then can lead to the pole, this north-south pole that balances the planet on its, on its axis. As that shifts, it causes chaos. You can get tectonic plate shifts, massive tsunamis, let alone if that magnetic field sh around the earth completely shuts down, like I mentioned, you can get this solar outburst that can basically fry the planet. Not only from um, what would potentially be like millions of lightning strikes that are all being charged out of the sky. Go check out the movie, The Core. Some of it is a little bit Hollywood, later on once they have to go into the core, but the first quarter of the movie is pretty much spot on with what happens during one of these events. They show like an image where the sun is able to, some of these solar outbursts are able to get through and they hit um, uh, San Francisco and like melts the bridge. Um, that, that is exactly what happened in the past. Now, what's the evidence for it? When you go to these megalithic sites, and I apologize for jumping around everywhere, it's a little bit late at night. When you go to these megalithic sites, um, could you jump around a little more, please? The, the, the ones that you know are from this time period because you can recognize the building. It's like once you get an idea of what to look for, you notice it all around the world from the Americas down th the Aztec and Maya down through the Olmec, right down through the Inca, across the world, Easter Island, Mesopotamia, up through the Mediterranean, Turkey, right over to Southeast Asia and Japan. You see it all around the world. It's this lost civilization that was destroyed. And they had a very specific building practice that they had at that time. Now, when you, when you go visit some of these sites, like I mentioned, specifically like Karnak, Egypt, and around 
in around Giza, the Sphinx enclosure area in around the Great Pyramids. Look at some of the temples and look at some of the building areas. You'll notice this thing called vitrification. It's kind of a big word. What it means is you see these, these incredibly dense granite blocks and all these different stones that are all perfect on all these corners. And then one side that's facing a certain direction has all been mangled. The, all the rock has been eroded. And that's what vitri vit vit vitrification means. It's essentially heat hits the rock and the, and, the, and the quartz that's within it so hot that it literally like melts it and breaks it apart. And that's what you're seeing at some of these sites. What kind of temperatures had to create that? And, and more importantly, if that could happen to solid rock, what would happen to the people that were, that were living there? They would probably be vaporized in, in, or they, if they didn't seek shelter. So when I talk about locations like Darren Kuyu, these underground cave systems that are in Turkey, right in the heart of the ancient world where all of these civilizations lived, it's, here you go, you find these massive underground built cities. Why were they there? Not to survive the floods that were occurring at the time, because that's not the, the best way to survive a flood. It would be to survive one of these solar outburst, outburst storms, because not only would you have absolutely unbelievable climate changes and, and heat and lightning strikes and all these different things, but you would have radiation too. And you wouldn't even be able to be on the surface for a certain amount of time before things eventually cleared. So if you're looking for the mechanism and the means for if you had a global civilization that was all living on these locations around the world, like in um, Tiwanaku and in places like Peru, and, and then you go around Lake Kitikaka specifically, these high elevation areas, and then these desert areas like in the Sahara Desert and over towards Giza, those in that civilization you know, without warning was probably completely destroyed. And only those elders and some of those, the highest priests that were warned were probably the ones that went into these caves to survive some of these events. At the same time, while that event is occurring, you're having things like the, the millions of lightning strikes from the charged ionization of the atmosphere are likely, there. We, we find that it would most likely have caused wildfires on a scale that is almost beyond comprehension because you had climate changes that were so dramatic based on specifically looking at ice core samples from Greenland during this time period, which is around 12,800 years ago. You had climate changes that were swinging back and forth. Some areas weren't raining anymore. Other areas were getting hit by intense lightning strikes. And so what you had is these forest fires traveling around the world. And we find this layer of ash that's in this very distinctive layer all around the world that we, that we can locate. And we can basically date all these different layers, soil layers, ice core layers, go read these tablets, go see what they say to coordinate and try to figure out, oh, when did all this occur? And you know, what happened to them? And so that really paints the picture of these, these, the devastation that occurred during this time period, which then led to whatever the survivors of that catastrophe were, they tried to rebuild civilization again, but they were largely unsuccessful. And over time, all of that ancient knowledge was then hunted down and in many cases eradicated and destroyed. And people might look at that and say, come on, really? Like who would really do that? Look what's going on right now as we speak. In Syria, we've lost some of the most important ancient sites in history in places like Palmyra and other locations because ISIS and these proxy armies have gone through and they've destroyed it, just like some um, Roman Empire did in Egypt when they came through during the dynastic pharaoh period. It's the same thing has been happening over and over again. Yeah, and, and I just want to make a, a point to that real quick also. I mean, if you look in California, and if you go to a place like Blythe, as an example, I'm going to be going out there again soon, there is evidence of these geoglyphs that you can see from the air. Like if you're in an airplane and you're flying anywhere from you know, 400 to 12,000 feet and up, you're going to notice these massive geoglyphs and they're very similar to the Nazca lines. And they're about 1300 years old approximately. And a lot of them were destroyed and intentionally destroyed back in world war two. So anything the MFers can do 
to suppress knowledge and hide and rewrite the narrative. It seems like they've been doing that now, and it, it, it has certainly bothered me, but the more we come together, it seems as if these pieces are being presented to where we're given the puzzle now. Yeah, it, it is. And, and that's why I wanted to preserve all these things, because we look at a place like I'm showing, um, this is the Royal Asher Bonapal Library that was found in Nineveh, Ira uh, Ira uh, Iraq in 1849. But this one library contained the majority of the mo these cuneiform tablets that that we that we talk about that I included in here one place one location because Asher Bonapal which was a great priest and king decided to go around and, and gather and amass these ancient translations so he could protect them and keep them all in one place okay that's that's essentially what I'm trying to do too I'm trying to carry on this legacy of preserving the wisdom and the ancient knowledge of the past so what happened to Asher Bonapal's library when he eventually died the Chaldea people and the Babylonians attacked the city of Nineveh and they destroyed and, and burned everything to the ground. And the only reason that these tablets survived is that they were created to survive. They were, they were created on um, clay that was then baked to be preserved. So this library was then dug up thousands of years later and boom, here we have this, this way of understanding the past. What would happen if this library had never been found? We wouldn't even have the Adrahasis. We wouldn't even have nearly, uh, nearly any of these stories that we have to understand what happened long ago, because the Adrahasis talks very specifically about the chaos that was occurring during the time period of when Adrahasis himself was giving rule, given rulership by his far, father, Ubaratutu, to rule the city of Sharupak. The city of Sharupak is mentioned in the Sumerian king list as being the very last city the last city of Mesopotamia that was that was um, ruled under kingship until the deluge destroyed everything, everything. And then you have this, you have what then goes on to, to talk about how Adrahasis was on, one of the only survivors of this event because he was he was forewarned because of the bloodlines that he happens to be part of. Okay, and so these these stories and the in this information from the past. All we have left are these pieces to try to understand, you know, how we could have had entire civilizations be destroyed. And then the more important question is how we could have had an amnesia of it all because so much time has gone by and so much has been destroyed and so much misinformation has clouded us, like you said, that people don't even believe it's real. Most people don't even believe that a lost civilization ever, ever existed. And I like to tell people, just imagine if... Today, I call this, I call our civilization, the, the great plastic civilization. But just imagine today, if some, if these disasters occurred just like they did back then, and they destroyed everything around the world, especially considering how dependent we become on things like electricity and other things like that, it wouldn't take very much to, to throw us right back to the stone age. Now, because of how in interconnected we are to a food network around the world that's connected by trucks and planes and boats and everything like that. One cataclysm would shut the entire system down and we would look at basically a reset. Now, what would happen if that reset was so severe that we were essentially wiped out and there was very little left that survived? Let's say thousands of years later, nature regrows itself. Everything, you know, iron oxide moves into metal and destroys everything over time. And eventually another civilization arises and they have these little bits and pieces of, of us from before. And some of them end up being convinced or their society is convinced that we never existed in the first place. That to me is an amazing thing to consider. Now, I don't think that could be possible considering the footprint that we've created here and the fact that our choice of plastics would mean that a lot of those would probably survive long into the future. That's why we would probably be known as the civilization that destroyed itself because they were using unsustainable methods you know, because of our dominance on plastic, fossil fuels and other things like that. But anyway, um, that's, that's, what, that's the idea we're trying to get across here is not an ancient civilization based on the internet and um, the world like we see today with high speed technology and all that. I don't, I don't think that that's the way it was at all. And I don't, I don't subscribe to that. But what we do find are these ancient civilizations had a very high level of sophistication in areas that we don't have. And I would argue 
there are much more important areas that they were sophisticated in than we are. The, the areas that we're sophisticated in with technology can often really disconnect us, us from not only the world around that we live in, but from the universe itself. It gives us almost this egotistical, materialistic illusion of a world where we become blinded by our own technological achievements and we ignore everything else that really defines what reality is. So these civilizations weren't blinded by that. They weren't blinded by materialism. They were all about creating massive, precise structures. They understand where every single ley line energy conversion center on the planet was. They built those ancient structures on every single one of them. They knew where they all were. They had this perfect, there was this massive grid system on the earth, harnessing free electromagnetic energy, just like Tesla figured out, just like he rediscovered basically later on. And that civilization with all of their wisdom and knowledge, which is what they based themselves on, was still destroyed, okay? And, and they, they, didn't even, they weren't even dependent on technology like we are, and they were still wiped out. And so that's the warning I wanna to give today because it leads into, well, you brought up, and, and, I'm, and I didn't forget, let's get back to what you, you brought up in the beginning. What's going on today? Why are there birds falling out of the sky and dying everywhere and not knowing how to travel through certain places? Why are, is, is our so many things being disrupted around our world? Why um, have the poles shifted and the native cultures that rely on stars telling us that changes are occurring? What's going on? Why, are, why would governments spend millions of dollars to billions around the world to, to do some kind of a geoengineering project to spray our skies? Is it about changing the climate? Is it about altering clouds and weather systems? No. It's because they found out what happened to these civilizations. And they found all about what happens with these cycles where the electromagnetic sphere of the earth starts to weaken over every certain amount of time. They found out about that. And they knew that our civilization was at a threat of being completely wiped out. So what did they do? First thing they did was they spent trillions of dollars through the black budget to create massive underground areas. Rex is very aware of all of these. That's what they sent, spent a lot of that money on. They were really, really worried that this was going to happen again. So they created entire areas. You can see them underneath many, many places out West in the central United States. They created underground areas where scientists and people that were chosen would go like in some movie and they would have completely self-sustaining um, ways to grow food and to live years until they could come back out. That wasn't become a, because of an asteroid or a comet strike. It was become, because of this event that, that is going on and is essentially happening right now, okay? And so they, they realized, well, what can we do? Well, we can spray the skies with a highly reflective particle to reflect that incoming solar radiation back out into space so we can try to slow the entire process down to try to prevent the sun from weakening. Because remember, it's this gradual weakening that occurs on the electromagnetic sphere of the earth, slowly weakens it, boom, the whole thing can collapse or in certain pieces can, and that allows it in to, to, to bombard certain parts of the earth. So there's, they sprayed the skies to create this Hot, using cheap, cheap byproducts of mining like aluminum and barium and other things that are highly ref reflective and cheap, but they're not very good for us to breathe in. Those, those particles are being sprayed in the atmosphere, in my opinion, to reflect as much of this incoming solar radiation as possible. While at the same time, what's with all this secrecy at the North and South Pole, right? You look at John Kerry visiting Antarctica and all these military um, influences that have occurred in the past. Is that because there's like some kind of, you know, ancient civilizations there or technology? Perhaps. But I think the more likely reason that a lot of that is going on is I think that there's a global organized effort by these elites to try to prevent this from happening. And I think they're using technology that we never had before. They're using technology down in the poles to try to prevent this wobble from taking place, this wobble of, our, of, of the pole shifts. Go ahead, Rex. Yeah, let me ask you about the wobbles and this possible preventative pole shift. I had a great discussion uh, with the gentleman a couple of days ago on, the, on a hike I took up to Chimney Rock, and his name's Randy. He's very knowledgeable. 
and um, we were talking about the pyramids and what he brought up. And I've heard this before, but he took it to a whole other level. What if the pyramids, not all of them, but some of these pyramids, like the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Cheops Pyramid, maybe the pyramid in Bosnia that's even bigger than the Cheops Pyramid. What if they were designed as something to keep the earth in balance? You know, like like a, a, a gyroscope or something like that, or like like a gimbal. You've got this gimbal right here, and it's got to be balanced when you've got your phone on it. Maybe they are designed and work with the magnetic field to keep some type of equilibrium. What are your thoughts on that? That's that's a great point. I, I think it directly relates into these structures were absolutely about managing energy. There's no question about it. They were de- they were definitely about managing energy. The question was either what did they need all that energy for or what were they doing with it essentially what was the purpose behind it because really that's all that's left all that's left are these ancient cuneiform tablets that talk about where where a lot of of our civilization and our world came from and then there's also just these megalithic structures left from all these temples and these pyramids that were built around the world and it's so crazy right we live in such a strange reality where People are literally directly conditioned into A, believe all that stuff that's creating these big clouds above your head, believe that those are contrails and confuse you into thinking that nothing's going on, right? When the whole sky is turning cloudy and milky. And if you just look up contrails, it's very, very easy to to notice that contrails in 100% of the time can never turn into a cloud. One, mark those words. Contrails are condensed moisture from planes that are in the upper atmosphere that creates a very temporary cloud of plume of moisture essentially that is just dissipates because it's not actually a real cloud regard but when they lay down particles into the upper jet jet stream using cirrus they can essentially overlay the cirrus to create like a giant rpg cloud okay i want to throw that out there at the same time we're in school and we're taught that the largest structures ever built on earth were built to house pharaohs. And yet there's never been a pharaoh ever found in those structures in history. It's so mind blowing that all these different pieces that have almost nothing to do with each other, but they are still important from different fabrics of our reality. We're just being completely lied to. And people are, have just taken that and run with it. And they just accept it as reality. They, you know, they, They'll just ignore anything that tries to disrupt this, this paradigm that we're given on everything. So I, this, the, the work that we're doing, you and I, and, and that a lot of the researchers that are coming out that are called crazy conspiracies theorists and all these things. No, we're just, we're just trying to share all of the things that have been, that have been done to us, all the things that have happened to civilization for thousands of years and all the lies and deceit that really started with the Roman empire and how they corrupted religion and then turned religion into this, this fear-based controlling mechanism that really took it away from its spiritual heart, which was all about just being a guide on how having to helping people to reach their higher state of conscious consciousness and realizing the, the true existence of what they represent. So Rex, I wanted to just change gears really quick. Um, and I just wanted to read uh, uh, just a, a quick paragraph from a tablet that I don't know if has ever been read online before, you know, because to me, we have to keep bringing this out. We have to keep bringing this stuff out. And so we can preserve this information long into the future. So in this, this tablet, like all the others that most have never heard of, this one is called the Epic of Adapa. Okay. And this is one of those tablets that talks about the very beginning of human civilization in mankind. And it, and it says, well, essentially, in a little a little quick backstory is essentially um, Adapa, also known as Adamu, was the son of Ea. And essentially, the story of the Epic of Dahu, Ad- Adama, is him being granted wisdom but not eternal life. He is he is made mortal, but he is given great wisdom. Okay, now listen to the words very clo- closely for what it says here, because we all have to go back and 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 recognize the biblical story of Adam and how it talks about how he was the first man. And then we, we look in the book of Enoch and we look throughout some of the other ancient Gnostic and ancient translations. And we see that Adam is actually mentioned as being one of these humans that lived for hundreds of years and was, a, was a different kind of person. So I want to read this little quote from the, um, the, 
epic of a DAPA just to give people some reference for how strange our reality is and, and the, the strangeness of where humans come from, not what we've been told. And, here, and here's a little quote from, from tablet one of the, of the um, epic of a DAPA. He possessed intelligence, his command like the command of Anu. He, Ia, granted a DAPA, a wide ear, to reveal the destiny of the land. He granted a DAPA wisdom, but he did not grant him eternal life. In those days, in those years, the wise man of Eridu, Ia had created him as chief among men, a wise man whose command none shall oppose, the prudent, the most wise among the Anunnaki he was, blameless of clean hands, anointed, observer of divine statutes. Isn't that interesting? It mentions as Adamu, Adapa, as being the wisest of all the Anunnaki, and yet he's a mortal man. I find that to be fascinating. And when you, when you, when you go into and you learn about how mankind came from this divine place, we were a perfect creation. We were a perfect creation that then became imperfect. And, and you find out that later on, there was some tampering of our genetics that later occurred, and we were in some ways dumbed down, and, and, we, and we lost a lot of what we used to have. When you read the Sumerian King List, and you read what I just wrote to, read to you, and you read things like the Book of Enoch and others, you find out that, that bloodlines and, and early, early humans long ago lived far longer than we live now. They lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. And clearly something happened within our DNA that was tampered with to reduce our lifespans. Because, you know, if a, if a being can only live for a certain amount of time, they're not able to acquire a certain amount of conscious awareness or wisdom. And then, of course, boom, what happens? They die and they have to come back and do, redo the whole incarnation cycle, repeat it over and over again, unless they can achieve this certain state of energy. And, and in many ways, I feel that the Atrahasis is talking about how humans um, alleviated the load of the gods and set them free. I think it was talking about giving them a, a, um, eternal life. Whereas we took on the burden of having to exist here in the physical world to take on this role of, 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 of living in these lives over and over again and incarnate, incarnating in, this, in, in lifetime after lifetime and, and having to play these roles here. So, so I'm I'm fascinated by these by these secrets of ancient history, essentially, Rex. You you have absolutely hit a grand slam tonight, Matt. I mean, this has oh, been thanks. this has been the best podcast we've done yet. We've had some amazing mind melds together. So wow. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually floating right now. I'm not even sitting down. I'm I'm floating from this high energy matrix that you've created. Conscious ascension, my friend. Yeah. Oh, and folks, I want to let you know, just I mean. Because it's, it's hard to get enough Matt, right? So he's on YouTube. I've got his link on um, in the video description box for his YouTube channel. I've also got the link for his website. Check out the website. The website is the star, or I'm sorry, the stage of time.com. The stage of time.com. It's a beautiful website. And also check out the YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button. He's going to be on coast to coast tomorrow night. I know that I'm not always popular with those who don't have a very open mind and they don't like the idea of um, trying to go to these uncomfortable areas because they are, um, you know, they're, they're so tricky to try to delve into. But I think that to me, that's the great challenge is we should, we should ask those difficult questions. We should go into that area to try to find out more. Cause I think that's one of the, you know, as we transition here, that's one of the whole purposes of our existence here is to explore the nature of reality because clearly this reality this universe or multiverse, as you want, if you, you want to call it, it's defi it's been created through very defined laws, and those laws are also based on this principle called free will. And it's our our purpose here as eternal conscious energy is to is to experience a physical reality in the third dimension and to explore it, explore what the nature of, of our reality is, and to learn. And when you do that, you just get your mind blown. All of a sudden, when you start to consider that we exist on a planet. Let's try to take ourselves out right now. Let's try to understand the, the scope of all of this. Think about all the people, if you just looked at Earth, think about all the people and what they're doing. 
shopping and then going home and just watching TV and then going to bed and getting up. And then they go to work all day and they come back and they go buy something new at the store. All of a sudden you have it's just add that up and just throw that in billions and billions of people doing that, right? Moving around, going to jobs, doing all that stuff all around the world. Just, you know, it's one of those things like in a movie where they slowly zoom out and that sound just disappears till it's just this, this faint muffle in the distance. And all of a sudden you zoom out and you just see earth and, and where, and here we are, we're this, we're this highly intelligent sentient species that's found on a planet that according to the Drake equation, this, this equation that was created from Frank Drake, where he postulated that, well, hey, look, if you just look at the ingredients that are, are needed for life, things like carbon and, and oxygen, if you look at how f- common that is throughout the known universe, and, or if you just look at it within our galaxy alone, it, you find that it's, it's present everywhere, everywhere, and that life isn't just some accident but life likely exists nearly everywhere, whether it's in microbial form or whether it's in sentient civilizations. Now, because of the distance between things known as space-time, and to give you a little idea behind that, and I use this example a lot, but it's, it's completely mind-blowing. If you wanted to try to get to our nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, it's two and a half million light years away. So if it was a, an advanced civilization and they're in the Andromeda galaxy and they're like, we're going to go to the Milky Way galaxy. We're going to explore just like in, like in, you know, Star Trek or something. If they were traveling at the speed of light, it would take them two and a half million years to reach there. The speed of light. Okay. That, that tells you that that's part of that hierarchy system that exists in the cosmos where so that it's any advanced civilization can't just be all over the place, polluting everyone's timeline all over the place and disrupting everything. Okay. At the same time though, there are ways to get around the laws of that define this things like wormholes and stargates and all these things that we've seen where you could travel between points, not in a linear way, but almost beyond space time. And I think that's where the, we should wrap our heads around where these gods of history, what they're all about. I think that's how we should consider the influences of our past with these ancient civilizations. The Sumerians clearly state in, in their tablets and cylinder seals that boom, out of nowhere, these civilizations just emerged where they were given agriculture, how to grow crops. They were given the knowledge of astronomy. They were given the knowledge of mathematics. I mean, think about it, mathematics. It's literally like finding the Rosetta Stone for the entire design of the universe itself. It's basically like the end game. If you know mathematics, you know everything. It's like you look at the universe and instead of seeing flickering stars, you just see numbers going by like in the matrix. That's all everything is. It's just this design based on very specific numbers and laws that define everything. So when we look at that, we have to wrap our heads around the idea that in our Milky Way galaxy alone, just in our Milky Way galaxy, and there are millions of galaxies that we know of, millions, but in our Milky Way galaxy alone, we haven't, we've estimated that there are more Earth-like worlds. And remember, this is part of that Drake equation where he looked at, okay, in a solar system that revolves around a star, you have maybe one or two planets that's close enough but not too, so far away that it can have support life. And that doesn't even get into talking about hydrothermal vents and heat. And I talk all about that stuff in the book. But what it gets into is talking about the, the idea that if, if just bare bones minimum, if you're talking about just like one planet per solar system that is, that is habitable for life, there are so many Earth-like worlds then, therefore, that exist in our Milky Way galaxy alone that they would exceed every single grain of sand on every beach on our planet. Try to wrap your head around that. When you go to the beach and you put your hand in the sand and you pick up a, a handful of thousands of grains of sand, and there are more Earth-like worlds in our one galaxy alone. And when you think about that and you wrap your mind around that and, you're, and you put your perspective on that, it becomes so silly to try to think that we're alone and that, oh my gosh, ancient civilizations could not have been influenced by any outside, anything outside of that. That's impossible, right? How could that be possible? Well, that's precisely why I try to protect these translations from these ancient cultures so, so much because they just give us the story of what happened long ago, which is basically that we had 
there was a primitive forms of humans that were here. It's this types of Neanderthals and Denisovians in different groups. Now, whether those were here naturally is part of a whole nother debate. They have, may have been part of a, a process of jumpstarting on, on a more natural basis, but over a much longer period of time by other ancient civilizations. However, when these beings who came here that they all speak about, they, they, these beings call themselves the great Anuna, and they call themselves the ordainers of destinies who create everything. And they're the ones who came here, according to these tablets, and they're the ones who gave human civilizations every bit of all the pieces of knowledge they have. But more specifically, they came here, and in the, according to the Adrahasis, they realized that they, they didn't want to do the work needed to exist in the third dimension anymore. They, they said that, and there was this, basically this revolt and those who decided they didn't want to be doing the work that we exist in. Think about what we do. When someone dies at the end of their life and they look back at what they did, they realize that most of their life, they've just been working. They've been like been working, doing, what have they been doing their whole life? Just doing something they've been told their whole life. That's what was, was essentially determined long ago by other beings who realized that they were sick of doing this. And so what they decided to do was instead of creating an AI, they just jump-started this, this work, this being here that was compatible with them. That's why, if you remember, remember I just read this translation from the, from the Epic of Adapa. They mentioned how this mortal man named Adapa is the wisest among the Anunnaki. They consider him them. He, they consider him the same as them because we are them. They essentially took their genetics and their genes and they created a worker in their image, just like Genesis says. They created us in their image. That's what it says, plainest day, right to you. They, they, not God, not this creator of all that is part of this natural process that exists everywhere. No, they, they created us in their image. And that's exactly what these tablets say too. We're not an ape. We're essentially a being from the stars. And we've been conditioned into not believing that for so long and kept in such a violent war mentality that we've been conditioned like that, like that uh, analogy that I've given before of how if you have two dogs that are both the same age, they've been born in a litter and one dog goes to a neighbor that's, that's incredibly nice and kind and it, it encourages that dog and it gives it lots of love and it lets it run around and, and be free. That dog is going to end up completely different than the other dog who has a puppy was given to the neighbor next door, who's a really violent person who hits it all the time, never lets it go outside, is always yelling at it. But those two dogs, not to say that humans are dogs, but it's all about understanding conditioning and what can happen over time with a certain kind of stimuli and a certain kind of conditioning and influences. That's what's happened to us. We're essentially like this divine being that can literally alter our reality if we become powerful enough. Look at Stranger Things that, just, that just aired. Stranger Things is the third season, great season. Talking all about how some human beings have these telekinesis abilities and all these ways to manipulate reality and alter everything. That's very real. And that's part of this legacy that existed long ago with our ancestors that we've lost now. We only have these remnants of what existed, that what we used to be, we're like these shells of what we used to be long ago. And now we're trying to regain essentially our divinity because we've had so long of being forced and conditioned into making us believe that we're someone that we're not. I mean, think about it for a minute. During things like World War I, World War I was an absolutely atrocious war that was, but it was a specific kind of war where the newspapers and people hadn't really fought a lot of, they hadn't fought world wars up to that point really. Okay, so most people didn't know the atrocities of war. So World War I, when it was first being fought in Europe, all the newspapers were just, it was all about being proud and fighting for your country and go do this. And, you know, you can regain honor in your family and all these things. So people would just, they would drop everything. They would march over there. They would proudly go out there. They would just run out in the battlefield. Woo -hoo! And then a machine gun would just gun them down. And within seconds, they're dead, gone. 
millions of people dead instantly. Think about the perspective I just gave you. Some incredible being from the stars who has the ability to alter reality and reach these high states of consciousness. What are they doing fighting in these trenches and shooting each other and killing each other and hating each other? That's, that's how we've been completely conditioned into our mentality to the point where we're all like these dogs fighting each other, but we're not supposed to be. We're, we were never supposed to be in the first place. And that's not supposed to be some hippie peace loving thing. It's a fact looking at how we spend our time, okay? And how we could be spending our time. That's really what it comes down to. It's not about like some masculine power, power play thing about being strong and getting a gun and going being, being tough and patriotic. To me, nationalism has been one of the greatest conditioned um, deceptive things that's ever been used against people in history. And that doesn't mean that I'm all against communities working together and all being part of somewhere that they're proud of. That has nothing to do with it. The nationalism I speak of is the idea where governments and those who are part of the, the political system and the, and the social system convince the public that artificial boundaries are enough to try to create extreme competition where you hate someone else that has some border that doesn't even exist. And you're trying to fight against them and create these wars and put almost your entire economy into a war-based mentality, military industrial complex, because you've convinced people that we're in this dangerous world. We all be defending each other and helping each other where really you're just siphoning all of the energy and the money and the focus of that civilization into fear and hate and war in this, again, that conditioned mentality. So when I, when I looked at all this information and I looked at how, um, civilizations have been handed down and created over time and, and all the laws and rules that have gone into the morality of our, of our society, it really becomes clear that everything has been, or, um, has been designed specifically to, to, to end up the way it is now. And I, I'm, I don't want to, I'm not going to go into this much further, but I just want to end up, end out on this by saying, when you look at thousands of years of history and how every single one of these Kings that then created a war or, or later on the bankers like our central bankers that still create the wars that just are continuous and endless over and over again. You can clearly see that there's this rule seems to be in place here. And you can read that about that too, where it's like, we can't have anything but chaos here because what happens if we don't have chaos, then all of a sudden progression occurs and people reach this next stage. So I want to get back to where we were before what do I think is happening right now? I think that we're under the stages of one of those great changes, processions of the equinox changes, which means that we're going into this new age, the age of Aquarius. And it means that we're under a new age of energy where this duality sh shift is supposed to occur, where we're supposed to go to this higher conscious place in a new golden age. That's what all the cultures have talked about throughout history. It was always coming. So then the idea right now is it's basically the, the, the dark, it's like, it, it is like the darkness right before, you know, the great dawning occurs right now where our world is at constant war and, and division, but yet society is going a different direction and becoming more conscious all the time. And it's that clash that's going on right now. And so I do believe though, because I want to, a lot of people get really scared thinking about what might happen to us. I think based on technology and the fact that we don't have an ice age, we don't have miles of ice caps across our entire Northern hemisphere that could melt instantly and create these massive global floods because we don't have that. And because technology is being used, just look up in the skies and look at what's going on in the South and North pole. I think we have a very good chance of getting through this to the next stage without losing everything. I do think that we're going to go through some more challenging times ahead. And that's why I think you're seeing so much earthquake activity and volcanoes and so many of those other things that are happening because our earth is still responding to what's going on. It's still responding. The question is how far will it go? Um, and so what I want to get at for a message to people to, to think about is we're in this very rare opportunity right now where we have this window, this doorway is open, this doorway to knowledge to higher knowledge about the past with the availability of the internet 
and all of this free in front of us and having some time, if we can separate it and, and, and organize our life, we have an opportunity to basically gain all the secrets of the past and learn all of this forbidden knowledge has been guarded and held back for so long. We're in that window right now. And that's why I can't emphasize the, the, the whole idea of why I provided that perspective I was just giving over the last 20 minutes or so is to don't be distracted by all those things that hold us back and make us think that we should be doing something in a specific way here, or we should be doing um, designating our life to do something, live your own life, do whatever you want, but you still have to play the game because there's been a game designed here. You can't, you know, go hungry and starve, play the game, but do live your life and try to um, accomplish what you want to accomplish. Don't be held back by all the things that try to force us into thinking that we should do something that just because everyone else is doing that. I think that condition mentality has created the problems that we have now. And that's really why I, why I do what I do and why I wrote the stage of time, because these secrets of our past completely redefined who we are. They redefine how we perceive the universe. They redefine how we perceive the nature of reality and they redefine the, the information and the knowledge where that came from long ago. It just completely changes our perspective. And I think that's why the status quo here is being so protected. Because it, every, if you learned that you're an infinite light being that's experiencing a reality in this mortal body just to learn, just to learn and grow on a spiritual level, that's it. That's literally your purpose here. Your purpose is not to go become the CEO of some bank or a lawyer somewhere. That doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. That's not going to carry with you to some other lifetime. Those are all distractions. Those are all things that can keep you from achieving what you really want to do. Because I guarantee you that those people would probably want to do something else instead of sitting in some lawyer office somewhere and, and going through law. I mean, I, there maybe are a few people that really love that. But for the most part, we really could be doing a lot of things other with other than what we're doing with our time. So I just, um, I just want to thank people like Rex and, and everyone that does this for really being the warriors of truth that we really need in our world today. It's, it's so amazing, Matt, what you've done just over the past few years. I'm, I'm really impressed with your, your knowledge base and the way that you present it. You continue to grow. The best way you can support my work Please go through the stageoftime.com with links and please leave a review after if you really enjoy it. I think that this book goes far beyond my words. It's about protecting these stories and this evidence and information about what happened long ago so we can learn the valuable lessons and not make those mistakes again. And we can understand where we came from and we can redefine how, how we understand reality and move to that next level get to the next stage of where we're going in our story. Do you, now the audience, we've got over a thousand people in the live chat. They, they're just saying amazing things. They're really excited to hear you on coast to coast. Also, they're hoping that you're going to come back on the program soon. They want to know if maybe you can take a few questions before we close out. Um, why don't you take like two or three? Cool. All right. We'll take two or three. Right on, right on. Okay, folks, we're only going to take three questions. He said two or three. So we'll say three <laughs> and <laughs> we're going to make them quick. So ask the questions. The question is, this is from shockwave. It's a great question. Shockwave says, Matt, the electric universe, what are your thoughts on the, um, he feels that because in the past, there's a good chance that our ancestors saw what looked like this giant dude in space because of whether it was a plasma discharge, a solar flare, a planetary flyby, Nibiru, Wormwood, whatever. Gotcha. Um, this, he was saying that, uh, you know, he feels that the, the squatting man, when you, when you brought up, we are created in their image, he thinks that's what is being referred to. What are your thoughts on that? I think the, what it comes down to is that's, that's a theory to try to explain some of these things, right? Oh, all these ancient cultures were looking up at plasma discharge storms. That was their gods. Those were the influences that they had. They, it looked, those plasma discharge storms were creating the figure of what looked like a human. So that's why they had those images. I don't feel that that is a defining thing to help explain all of this in the past. 
Um, however, getting back to the electric universe and talking about that, I think if you get into it, and someone would be like, oh, everything's fake because it's a holographic universe. So there, therefore everything's fake and nothing's real and space is fake. I think that goes along with electric universe in, in a way where we got to look at the universe as being, yes, it's defined by non-physical things. It's defined by these electromagnetic connections, electric, electrical connections between bodies that create it based on their mass. But it's also defined by, basically everything is defined by vibration. The, the, the vibrational frequency of everything is what's defining it. And we're just perceiving it in its physical form. So therefore, the idea of the holographic universe and the electric universe is the idea that if you break everything down beyond just the physical appearance that we view, everything can be, can be defined by just its vibratory electric nature, essentially. Excellent. Question number two is, what are the oldest known texts that you feel are the oldest texts and where do they come from? I think that would be a, a combination of two different areas. In Mesopotamia, the oldest text is likely is likely the Enuma Elish and the Sumerian King List, because what they talk about essentially goes back farther than any other tablet talks about. Like the Sumerian King List talks about the kings that ruled Sumer before the flood, again before these disasters of the Younger Dryas, the end of the Ice Age that, that I was talking about before that tablet is talking about the kings that specifically ruled in the specific cities that it mentions before, before the flood. I mentioned that, um, that epic of Adapa, how he's, remember this phrase? Remember this phrase? It's all connected. This is how you know that they're truth because you find information that carries over from tablets in all different locations. It says, in those days, in those years, the wise man of Eridu. So, Eridu is mentioned in the Sumerian king list that one I just mentioned as being the first city ever made on created on earth. That's why I think those tablets are the oldest. At the same time, I think the information within the emerald tablets is, as well may be some of the oldest ever written because it specifically talks all about Atlantis and about how Atlantis was destroyed. And then that information had to then be carried to Egypt where they was known as Chem, where then those civilizations were created based on that. So I would say um, the oldest translations and information, and I, I guess I'll throw in, I think, I think the Vedic texts in the Sanskrit, those are also very old too. These are all just ancient civilization writings that get back to try to tell us what happened long ago. They all contain valuable information. You've got to remember the hieroglyphs and the writings that we have from ancient Egypt, that was done from the dynastic pharaohs. That's who came, those are, the, those are the civilization that emerged way after the disasters. They came into Egypt. They found the Chem civilizations that had come from Atlantis. They found the remnants of all those destroyed civilizations. They found the remnants of the pyramids, the pyramids themselves, and the Sphinx probably buried in sand. And we know that because the Sphinx enclosure has watermarks around the edge of it that are very defined that we can look at climate records and know that it's over 10 to 12,000 years old. And you also look at where constellations were based on the precession of the equinoxes when it was facing Leo. Well, I think what you said there was, was beautiful. And it also made me consider, and we've talked about this before, if you go back before this cataclysm that most likely took place about 12,000 years ago, this major cataclysmic event, if you go back to this timeline of civilizations that were building the Great Pyramid, the yeah. Bosnian Pyramid, the Sphinx, which the Sphinx was probably at one point, and you brought up it was facing Leo, constellation yeah. of Leo. It was probably a lion head also. It was probably Absolutely. representing Sekhmet or something, or a very beautiful being similar. Sekhmet was this beautiful lioness goddess that could be very scary, but also very loving and kind. And, and you know, Matt, what I'm, what I'm thinking is if we go back to when Thoth was around in Atlantis, they probably didn't even have language like we do, man. They could probably, they were probably communicating telepathically. They could probably pat your shoulder and then you are like, oh, that's how your day was. Okay. It's just like a quick download of your friendship. You know what I mean? I agree. I, I think the telekinesis, I think that are um, in many ways, when you look at how advanced humans could become, 
speaking might actually be quite a primitive form of communicating in comparison to where, what the mind and what, in what the mind is capable of in a more advanced human. When you're, um, when you're hanging out at home, quick example, and you, um, all of a sudden you, you think to yourself, this, this name pops in, right? Like, Oh, Rex bear. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Right. There's a thought. It's like, Oh, Rex bear in my head. And then boom, Rex, you call, right? Rex bear calls me. You're like, that's weird. I was just thinking about you. That is a remnant of that telekinesis ability we used to have. That means that you're connected to someone else on a level where you know them pretty well, right? And so that person is putting their mind completely focused on saying, I'm going to call this person. So they actually do that, right? Okay, I'm going to call Matt, Rex says. He picks up the phone, he's dialing me. But that thought and that connection of doing that, that's already gone through. That's why I get the person will all of a sudden a name will pop in their head and then the person will call. That's a little piece of that leftover telekinesis ability that we still have. That's, that's from what we used to be and all the gifts we used to have that are largely gone now and have been unplugged. James says, Rex, ask Matt about Mars refugees crash landing on Atlantis. Ooh, sounds like the GG. That's a great question. Yeah. And I think about that all, all the time. I decided not to talk about Mars in the stage of time, but I did talk about a lot of other secrets of the solar system, including our moon. Now, my, I talked about Mars in my previous book. Now, my feelings on Mars are, I definitely believe there are remnants of civilizations that once existed there. Are they connected to the Anuna just like the ones on Earth? Or are they somehow part of why those beings came here, right? That's the, that's the million dollar question. We don't know, but what we do know is one of two things happened to Mars that destroyed those civilizations. Either those similar solar outbursts that, that affected the earth hit Mars worse, or they may have actually even destroyed themselves in nuclear weapons. One of those two outcomes occurred, but what we know is, or what we think based on the evidence, it seems pretty clear that when you look at the anomalies and the structures in places like the Cydonia area of Mars, it seems impossible that those structures could be aligned at the distances and precision that they are with, with the angles and the shadows if they were natural structures. This isn't like some Mars rover image where someone takes a little, thinks they see something over there and, oh, look at that. That's, that looks like a, a little alien poking out and smiling and waving at you. Like, come on, like that's, that's silly, but there, I mean, let's get past that idea, but let's really look at the remote sensing side of this. And when you study remote sensing a little bit, you learn to read and look at these satellite imageries and look at this imagery that's taken and you start to dis distinguish the different things around the ground. You see that things like the face on Mars and not in this, in Cydonia have these very distinctive patterns that are not only are they very clearly look like temples and pyramids and a large face, a monument, but they're aligned in these distances that are all part of like sacred geometry, just like the designs of them. A lot of the megalithic sites are on earth. They're part of what's called sacred geometry. And that's what the, a lot of the, that's what the Freemasons were all about. And that's why Washington DC is designed around like a giant pentagram with all the streets. People look at it, goes, go to Google, Put on Street View and zoom way out on Washington, D.C. and look at how all the streets connect. That's not an accident. That's part of sac sacred geometry because the Freemasons and the secret societies of the past, it was always about sacred geometry and energy. That was, what, that was what it was all about. That was what we've lost now, essentially. So, yeah, I think that Mars definitely had an ancient civilization. When that was, we don't exactly know. But we do know that Mars had water and life all over it. And that disaster was so severe that it completely destroyed the entire planet. And all that's left is like a dusty world where the only water that remains is subsurface and in small little ice caps in northern, northern and southern tips. Thank you so much for coming on the program. It was an absolute honor, a pleasure. I feel extremely lucky. And we got to do this again. Folks, go to Matthew LaCroix's website and his YouTube channel. So the new website is thestageoftime.com, thestageoftime.com. The link to the YouTube channel is in the video description box. All right, everybody, be excellent to each other. Be the change the world needs to see starts with you.